All right, we got a very special guest on the podcast today, Xavier Moon, um, three-time uh, CEBL MVP coming in. Uh, we are very excited. He's already got the white single leg compression on, um, and he's tried them out a few times, says he likes them, so we'll get into that in a little bit, but we want to start the podcast off the same way every single time. Xavier, I'm going to leave it up to you. The question is, what is your story? Hey, I'm a I'm a small town kid, man. Uh, I come from Goodwood, Alabama. Uh, born and raised, maybe like five, six hundred people in my town. Um, not highly recruited out of high school. Um, decided to take the JUCO route coming out of high school. Um, that was probably like one of the best decisions I made. Um, choosing to go to JUCO. Um, stayed there for two years. Transferred to Moorhead State in Kentucky. Finished my last school. Um, got my degree in sports medicine. Um, and been playing pros ever since. Um, so I'll be going into my fifth year um, this year when I just signed with um, Agro Caliente Clippers winning the G League. Absolutely. So can we can we back it up a little bit? I want to I want to talk about your childhood. So we we did a little bit of research on you before we started the show, and I found that you averaged thirty five a game your senior year. Is that true? Yeah, I led the state for in my senior year. Um, Man, I got I got a lot better um, from my junior to my senior year, and I think it's because I played football. Um, so I chose to play football my senior year, um, and that helped me tremendously on the basketball court. So I went from averaging like 18 to like 35. Um, <laughs> I found out I was leading the state in scoring, which is crazy. But yeah, man, I, it's true. <laughs> so like, and then it, I, if I recall, it was like 48. You put up 48 in a semifinal game and 50 in the champion in the state championship. No, nah, I put up um, – so it was like the game before the semis, I had 48. And then a game at 50, but I had, I had 40 probably 12, 13 times that whole, the whole year. <laughs> so, so I guess my question then is like, how does a dude averaging 35 and putting up 40 multiple times get – like were you, you were under-recruited, correct? Yeah, I, I didn't have that many offers. Um, I got my first offer after basketball season. Um, my coach was coming to watch another kid play like during the season, and I just so happened to be playing against him. Um, I think I had 40 that game. So uh, they reached out after after the season, and after that, that's when my recruiting like really took off. It was like probably early middle of April, graduated in May. So I think that's when my recruiting took off. So what do you what do you think it was like? You're putting you got the numbers, you got the stats. Was um, it just you're not playing AAU in the right spots, or like was it what was I, it? I never played AAU growing up. Um, I played like on two, maybe two teams, but I only played like a couple games. So I wasn't really big in the AAU. Um, and then my school is like, it's hard to find. The location of my school is like not, it's like off the road. So it's like a hard school to find. And I'm from a small town. So not many people, not many coaches are coming here. Right. What is, so you spoke about your two years in JUCO and, and it obviously was a very positive experience. And I think all of us can say we know people who have gone the JUCO route that it has worked out for them really well and maybe some that it hasn't worked out. Um, what was like the most uh, – what, what was the most successful part of your JUCO experience? Um, probably the players I played with. Um, I played with a lot of high-level guys, um, a lot of guys that came from Division One my first year um, and then got back to Division One after they left. Um, so to have them guys in there like my first year, and learn as much as much as I could from them. Uh, that really helped my game grow from my um, freshman to my sophomore year. And then I became six man my sophomore year and, and pretty much did the same thing, learn from everybody that we had in there. And then I took that on to Moorhead State. How did you how did you get from the JUCO to Moorhead? Did did the coach come to a game and see you or how did that process go? <laughs> um well they was in contact with my coach and we used to have like open practices where it would be like coaches week. So all the coaches would come in and watch the player that they um, had their eyes on. And I took a visit. I think that was like my third visit I took. Um, and I actually ended up signing before I left the visit. <laughs> you said you said you already signed with them before you left the visit. Yeah, I signed. The, the day that I was leaving my visit, I signed with Moorhead State. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? It was just impulse? You like, you, just, you, like, you loved it and you wanted to go? I, I loved everything about it. Um, the whole atmosphere, mm -hmm. the the family vibe. Um, it was a small. It's a small town too, just like where I'm from. 
Um, so it was like an easy decision for me to make. Mm-hmm. So walk us through that decision a little bit because <clears throat> it's it's a cool like story to see you go through like a, a, a small town kid, not highly recruited, obviously still really good, putting up insane numbers in high school. Uh, not highly recruited, gone the JUCO route, um, sort of like – to actually put that pen on the paper to like walk on the campus as an actual student for the first time to get your first, you know, steps on the gym before your first practice, like what's going through your mind? Um, I never thought I'd be there. Um, Cause I went really like, I'm, wherever I'm playing at, it's always, I'm focused on that. And then whatever happens after that, then I'll focus on that when it get when it comes. But um, coming from high school and then actually signing to go to JUCO, I mean, obviously, you know, it's only two years there, so you got to figure out what's next. Well, I was playing ball, so I'm like, okay, I, I can get a scholarship playing ball, and that'll be good. Um, and like I said, I got a lot better from my freshman to my sophomore year. So when I had the opportunity to sign Moorhead, I'm like, man, this is a Division One program. Like, everybody in the country, like, dreams of signing a Division One scholarship. So when I signed it, man, and then I got there, it was like, okay, this is real. And then you start seeing, like, the work that you got to put in to be a Division One athlete, which is crazy to a lot of people. That can't. Yeah, a lot of people don't know like what goes into being a Division One athlete, like school weights, all that. Type of stuff. Everything you don't see, I mean, it's, it's it's a grind. So I mean, that's where that's where that love for the game comes in. Walk us walk us through an average day that you had at Moorhead. What's what's an average like in practice in season? So in season, uh, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you got weights at 6 a.m. Um, you got to be there 15 minutes early. And if you, I mean, 545, like on the dot, you got to be there. So um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, weights at 6. Then everybody got to go to breakfast at well, whatever time you get done, pretty much till 8 o'clock. Um, some people got class at 8 a.m. Some people got class at 9. Um, so you got class pretty much all day. Mm-hmm. And you might. I have individual from 10 to like 12. So you got different groups of individuals. Then you got another class. Um, then you got practice. Practice used to be two, three hours. So you never know when you're going to get out of practice. And then you got study hall. So, I mean, we had a, we was on study hall and you had to get a certain amount of hours in the week. So, I mean, you got to stay in study hall till 9, 10 o'clock at night. And then you're getting up this next day doing the same thing. Was was study hall required for every everybody on the team, or was it like I don't care if you had a four point study hall, whatever whatever study hall, whatever time study hall was set for, everybody's in there. If you don't have work to do, you got to find something to do. But from that those two hours in study hall, you stand in there the whole two hours. Okay, I love hearing the story. So we Brandon and I both played at at a Division three school in uh, in Virginia. Um, so our days consisted of like class and then like a practice, like a two, three hour practice. And I remember leaving practice being like, God, I'm so tired. Like I have so much stuff to do. And then like you hear like all that stuff. And like we had a, we didn't really have an off season and like it's wild. Um, so I have a I want to see if you can. How do I want to phrase this? What was the bigger feeling of accomplishment for you? Was it? The first day at Moorhead, or is it like your first day as a professional basketball player, like signing your first contract? Like what, you know what I mean? Like what took longer to get to? What was harder to get to? Um, I think it was that first, that first time I signed as a pro, like to go to France. Because, I mean, it's something that you dream of. But like I said earlier, a lot of people won't get there um, for whatever reason that is. But to actually sign that contract, like a couple months after I graduated, was big, especially like in France, because it's a good, it's a good league. Oh, um, yeah. So signing that first contract, man, and then actually getting there was like crazy. Like I'm, this is what I dreamed of. Now I'm in a whole another country for eight nine months, and doing what I'm doing without school. Like I don't have nothing else. I got so much free time. So I think that was probably like my biggest accomplishment. What is what do you think was the bigger like uh, culture shock? Was the basketball a bigger culture shock, or was like actually physically living in France different? Absolutely not. The basketball comes easy. Yeah. <laughs> living, <laughs> living in another country is the whole culture shock. Um, everything, language barrier, food, like all that type of stuff. I mean, that was all new to me. Um, Cause that was my first time like out the country and I was by myself. But I mean, you, you learn to adapt um, to a certain extent. You learn to adapt. But being in France, man, that was probably like the, the hardest place I played just because 
nobody really speaks English. Mm -hmm. um, you pretty much on your own, so you got to figure it out as you go. So what was that process like for all the dudes out there that are D1, D2, D3, trying to go pro? How did you, how did you do it? Taking it one day at a time. Like I've been doing that since I was 13, 14. Um, like I said earlier, I don't look too far ahead. Like if I, like I just signed to go to the G League. Like, yeah, I'm focusing on that now. But it was it was in the process while I was playing in Canada, but I wasn't worried about that. Um, I was just focusing on my season then, and then after that was done, now I can focus on that. So take it one day at a time, man, and focus on what's right in front of you. But did did an agent approach you, or did you do some marketing of your own to, like, get seen? Did Like, how did that process go specifically? I mean, I've always been – everybody's always reached out to me. Um, mm -hmm. Usually I'm playing in Canada during the summer. So um, it's a lot easier to come watch or it's a lot easier to get access to the games. So after my season up there, then I had a, actually had a couple of coaches reach out um, and a couple of coaches in the CBL um, coaching the G League. So they was like, man, there's no way I shouldn't be playing in the G League or high level overseas somewhere. So you yeah, so. You, or, go ahead. Go ahead. You went from I'm trying to think of the timeline. You went from Moorhead to France, then to Canada, or you went to Canada first, and that's how the the coaches in I, France saw you. I went from Moorhead, then I went to France, and then okay. I played in New York, like in between France and Canada for okay. like a couple. Yeah, after that, then I went to Canada. All right, so we're definitely going to talk about the G League because. First off, we've said this before, but congratulations, man. Like, Appreciate amazing. You. Absolutely. Yeah, amazing. And knowing, like, it just happened recently, and, like, we're extremely excited for you. So we're definitely going to touch on that in a little bit, but I don't think we can gloss over the a crazy amount of success that you had playing in Canada over the past couple of years with, like, the multiple final MVPs and winning championships and stuff. So I know when people think about European basketball, it's obviously different, and I don't think – I think people are – very undervalued, like the atmosphere and the, and the fans and just the whole culture of basketball in those countries. So what is it like after winning a championship in, in not America? You know what I mean? Like yeah. speak to the people and let them know like how I'm, I can only imagine how amazing that was. Man, like to do it. Well, last year we were in a bubble. So it was a lot different. Um, obviously because of COVID, we was in a bubble in St. Catharines. So it was a lot different. Um, winning it there because we wasn't around like no fans or nothing like that. But I, the league still did something like great for us, like a whole barbecue and all that after we won. Um, but coming back to Edmonton and then winning it in front of fans was, was like crazy. Um, and the amount of love that I get up there is, is insane. <laughs> so like to win the championship in front of them fans and to do it back to back and then like see how they stormed the floor, like came out there and showed their love and stayed until the whole thing was over with, till we cut the nets down. Like, they stayed the whole time. So the amount of love that they've shown me the last three years is insane. Like, I don't, I don't even know how to put it in words, to be honest with you. So Well-deserved. You said, you said it was a bubble, so they did a bubble up there too, similar to the yeah. NBA. Yeah, like, when the NBA started, the NBA was the only other league that was playing. Like, we played in from July 25th to August 9th. So it was only like a couple of weeks. It was like eight games. So you playing, you might play today and tomorrow, then you got a day off, then you play two more games. So we were in a bubble in uh, Ontario for like two, two weeks. So, so was that similar to the NBA bubble where you had to stay in a hotel room and you like, they brought you food or like, what was, what were the logistics of that? So the Americans, once we got there, because we got there way earlier than everybody else. So we had to quarantine for those 14 days in a hotel. Um, they brought us breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but we couldn't leave the room. So after we got yes. our after we got our negative test, then on that 14th day, then we could come out the room and socialize and all that. But if we got a positive test, we had to stay another five, four days, three or four days. Mm -hmm. Some people are doing like 17, 18 days, and other others are getting out at 14. So then after that, like you're kind of free to roam throughout the facility. Like you can go to a hotel, go to the facility. Like how did that work? Go wherever you want to. You can go wherever you want to once they let you out of quarantine. It oh, was so, not. So you were free within within the area? Yeah, you can go anywhere. Okay. You just can't nobody in the hotel. Like nobody, okay. nobody besides players, coaches, staff, like nobody can be in the hotel. 
but you can go, you can go wherever you wanted to go. Okay. That makes sense. All right. So I would say, Brandon, it's safe to say for the rest of this, let's fire some G League. I want to talk about the G League. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, now, hold, let up, me hold, up, hold up, hold up. I got a quick one. I got a quick one. You, you, am I correct in saying that you are the first and only person to score a triple or have a triple double at Moorhead State? Yep. You, you got to walk us through that game. Well, do you remember your stat line? Like, how did that how did that work? Who was it against? What was the weather like outside? How many fans were <laughs> in attendance? We know you know all these details. Yeah, I do. We played against Central Arkansas. Um, actually, one of my teammates in Edmonton played on their team. And I didn't, I didn't even know it until he told me. But we played against Central Arkansas December 11, 2016, 25, 11, and 10. <laughs> I actually I didn't even have a triple-double when I came out of the game, I only had nine rebounds. But my coach, I mean, one of my assistant coaches was telling me, like, hey, you got nine rebounds. And it was like 40 seconds left. I'm like, what? Like, I'm going back in the game. So I went back in the game and I was out there chasing this, this last rebound. And I got it with like 30 seconds left. And then, That's awesome. Russell Westbrook a little bit. Man, I was out there trying to get it. <laughs> just, it doesn't matter whose team he's on. He's just going for it. <laughs> did you, did you uh, before the game started, did you feel something where you're like, this is about to be a wild game for me? Um, I did. Did you feel the triple devil coming? No, I felt it like halfway through the second half, though, because I was, I, I was, everything I threw up was going in. Every Everybody I passed to was making shots, and I'm like, okay, every rebound that come off, I done got it. But I didn't think I was that close to a triple double until I went to the bench. He was like, you just need one rebound. But and I didn't know I was the first one in school history to do it either. Are you still today? Do you know still anyone? Today. Still today. Congrats. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, list that under your accomplishments, baby. That's great. That resume is um, growing. <laughs> yeah, add that to the resume. Um, all right. So I love to ask this question, especially so again, like this whole podcast is kind of rep your story, talk, get to know the person behind the person a little bit. So I love to ask this question when, about like big moments in people's lives. So like that G League contract, finally getting that G League contract. Um, when you're signing it, do you look back on like your, your time growing up in Alabama and like that small town, like that gym, like under under recruited kid, like, you know, what, what kind of floods back into your memory when you're when you're going through that process? Everything, everything you just mentioned, the whole process it took for me to get here from high school to college to overseas, um, and then having the opportunity to stay in the States and play, and just having that, having somebody give me the opportunity to stay here and play. Um, I worked out for a couple teams, I worked out for Dallas, I worked out with the Pelicans, um, the Clippers, obviously, and I had a couple of others that I probably could have worked out for, but I thought this was the best decision I could have made to be. Uh, with the Clippers, so everything definitely starts coming back, man. Once you sign that that G League, and because you know it's so close to being in the league, so it's like, man, it's a dream come true. To be honest, so how did they like? How, obviously, <laughs> never gotten hit up by unfortunately any G League teams <laughs> of my own, but not yet. How, not, not yet. yet. I, hey, these men's leagues, I'm putting up numbers. Uh -huh. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> How did they how did they reach out to you? Did they come to the championship game in Canada or did they just like send you an email? Like how does that work? Uh they actually hit my agent up. Um okay. set up, they set up workouts. So they asked me when I was available and they set up well, I did a private workout with the Clippers um in Atlanta because my one of my coaches live in Atlanta. So I did a private workout with them. Um the workout in Dallas was more like a um like to try out like a tryout workout. So it was, it was like 30, 30 guys in there, but it was invite only. Um, and the one with the Pelicans was pretty much the same, um, but I didn't even have to go to that one. I just went because I wanted to play. Um, they pretty much had already offered me a roster spot. They was just like, I mean, you can come up here and play if you want to, but you don't have to. So, I mean, I drove to Atlanta and worked out with the Clippers one weekend. And then the next weekend I flew to Dallas and worked out with them. And then the weekend after that, I drove up to Birmingham and worked out with the Pelicans. So, I mean, most of the time they hit your agent up, unless they got your contact info directly, then they hit you up directly. Mm -hmm. uh, what have you, when do you like, uh, like officially start? Uh, I get out there on the 24th. Training camp starts like immediately after that, like a couple days after that. So the season starts on November 10th. 
so as for somebody who, I mean, is just getting into the G League, obviously you're not like in the locker room there yet, but I, I imagine you can feel some sort of a sense of what the environment's going to be like. The G League is like such a special organization collection because it's just full of guys who are so close to that next step and like that plateau that they're chasing. Um, <clears throat> can you describe it all like the, the environment or the, the feeling that you have, like talking to other guys or coaches? Is it just like, it's just a bunch of guys like right, right there on the cusp of like what they've been trying to get to all their life. Like to us, regular people, what is that like? <laughs> <laughs> man, I'm anxious, man. It's, like I said, it's something I've been working for since I started playing. So I'm anxious, excited. Um, not really much, many nerves. Um, Cause it's, I mean, it's just basketball at the end of the day. Um, and I put in the work, so I don't, I feel like I don't have a, a reason to be nervous. Boy, I'm definitely anxious, man, ready to get started um, and see what this G League got to offer. Yeah, man, so you, that, date, that date can't come soon enough. Honestly. So you you were on – you almost made Toronto's 905, right? Yeah. So you, was, so you were one of the last cuts, correct? Yeah, that was in 2019. <clears throat> um, yeah, they almost made 18. But they had a lot of guys in there, Tyler Ennis. Jawan Evans, like I had a lot of guys that I already played in the league, so I already knew what the deal was with that. Okay, so it, it that was expected. It wasn't like a last. Minute. It did. Okay. Like wasn't no, wasn't no last minute thing. So does this does this feel even better now? Like knowing that you, yeah, okay. Yep, because I I mean I signed, I worked out for the coaches. Like they they know who I am, so it, it, it feels a lot better. Is it is it the type of thing where you can't wait to to play them now? Every oh, bucket, yeah. every bucket oh, yeah. you're looking over yeah. at the coaches like you could have had you could have had this. Absolutely. <laughs> I cannot uh, wait. Mac, we gotta tune into that game. <laughs> oh, I mean, at this point, we're boys. Um <laughs> last couple of questions. This question has nothing to do with basketball, but what is up with the hot buns situation? Are you like obsessed with hot buns or something? You got fans, fans sending you hot buns and stuff. Is that like your I, thing? They bring them to the game. Like hot I had buns. Yeah, the first game of the season, I had a fan, like, he was sitting courtside, and he had, like, two two boxes of honey buns, like, sitting like that. <laughs> and after the game, man, like, it's just – it's always something. They'd, like, they'd be like, can you autograph this? Let's take a picture. And then, obviously, I'll take them home and eat them. But, are you, I mean are – you, Are you bringing the honey buns to the G League, or is that, like, strictly – strictly <laughs> business now? It's going to be a thing wherever I go. Like, it ain't just up there. It's all over. Wherever I go, I have honey buns. Hey, they they commented on the photo. You can get a sponsorship out of that. That's what I'm saying, yo. I'm that's right. Do that. We talk, yeah, I talk to Debbie all the time. That's hilarious. <laughs> you talk to a little Debbie. Do a sponsorship, <laughs> man. All right, so we're trying to keep these nice and short, but I do want to close it out with: uh, Is there any shout outs you want to? Actually, no. Before we before we end, you have an uncle in the big three. Is that correct, Jamario? Yep. Has he given you any advice? I can't believe we almost missed that. I almost ended this thing before. We it was on the back. It was at the bottom of our notes. We would have gotten to it. Gotten yeah, to exactly. It. Has he? Are you? Are you like a, in a good relationship with him? Like, does he help you out a lot? Is he get a good guide for this this whole situation? For sure. Um, we yeah, our relationship is very strong. We talk all the time. Uh, whenever he come down here, man, we play one on one all the time. And he's probably big, being my biggest influencer by by him going through the whole process and. Seeing the inside and out and going through it and all that, man. So he just he gave me the same the same advice that somebody would have gave him a long time ago when he was doing it. So I mean it's fun to have him in my corner. Who who wins those one on one matchups? Man, it go either it can go either way. It just depends <laughs> on what they <laughs> So how was how old were you when he was in the NBA? Um when was that? Two thousand seven? That was two thousand seven. Man, I was a young pup. <laughs> I was a young pup, man. I was so like, was that was that cool? Like, was that kind of that give you a goal kind of a thing where it was like, I, I I know him, I I see him doing that, I can do that too. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I still think like that now. Like, man, he's still playing, and he's forty one. I'm like, man, I can do that too. So, yeah, I guess the way I'm just following. Absolutely. Max, you listen, man. Else? Yeah, I got nothing else, man. I just I wish you the absolute best of luck, man. We're we were super pumped when we saw 
when we saw your Instagram post the other day about about your new uh, your new signing and new accomplishments. We're big fans of yours. We think you're awesome. Um, really appreciate the support that you've given us, and happy to hear that you like our product and everything fits and, and good. And I hope I hope they uh, it brings you as much uh, as much luck as you got going moving forward in the G League. Hey, I really appreciate it, man. Appreciate y'all for having. Is there is there any shout outs that you want to give before we close this out? Where can people find you, follow you? Um, Instagram, xmoon02. I'm not really on Twitter that much, but they can follow me, Xavier on this for a moon. <laughs> cool. I mean, cool. I'm pretty much. All right, man. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yes, sir. I appreciate y'all.